This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Return of the Native by Thomas Hardy Book 4 The Closed Door 7. The Tragic Meeting of Two Old Friends He, in the meantime, had aroused himself from sleep, sat up, and looked around. Eustatia was sitting in a chair hard by him, and though she held a book in her hand, she had not looked into it for some time. "'Oh, well, indeed,' said Klim, brushing his eyes with his hands. "'Oh, soundly I slept. I've had such a tremendous dream, too, one I shall never forget.' "'I thought you had been dreaming,' said she. "'Yes, it was about my mother. "'I dreamt that I took you to her house to make up differences, "'and when we got there we couldn't get in, "'though she kept on crying to us for help. "'Oh, oh however, dreams are dreams. "'What o'clock is it, Eustatia? "'Half past two. "'So late, is it?' I didn't mean to stay so long. By the time I've had something to eat, it will be after three. Anne is not come back from the village, and I thought I would let you sleep on till she returned. Klim went to the window and looked out. Presently, he said, musingly, Week after week passes, and yet mother does not come. I thought I should have heard something from her long before this. Misgiving, regret, fear, resolution ran their swift course of expression in Eustatia's dark eyes. She was face to face with a monstrous difficulty, and she resolved to get free of it by postponement. I must certainly go to Bloom's End soon, he continued, and I think I'd better go alone. He picked up his leggings and gloves, threw them down again, and added, As dinner will be so late today, I will not go back to the heath, but work in the garden till the evening, and then, when it will be cooler, I will walk to Bloom's End. I am quite sure that if I make a little advance, Mother will be willing to forget all. It will be rather late before I can get home, as I shall not be able to do the distance either way in less than an hour and a half. But you will not mind for one evening, dear? What are you thinking of to make you look so abstracted? I cannot tell you, she said heavily. Oh, I wish we didn't live here, Klim. The world seems all wrong in this place. Well, if we make it so... I wonder if Thompson's been to Bloom's End lately. I hope so, but probably not, as she is, I believe, expecting to be confined in a month or two. Ah, I wish I'd thought of that before. Poor mother must indeed be very lonely. I don't like you going tonight. Why not tonight? Something may be said which will terribly injure me. My mother is not vindictive said Klim, his colour faintly rising. "'But I wish you would not go,' Eustatia repeated, in a low tone. "'If you agree not to go to-night, I promise to go by myself to her house to-morrow and make it up with her, and wait till you fetch me.' "'Why do you want to do that at this particular time, when at every previous time that I've proposed it you have refused?' I cannot explain further than that I should like to see her alone before you go, she answered with an impatient move of her head, and looking at him with an anxiety more frequently seen upon those of a sanguine temperament than upon such as herself. Well, it's very odd that just when I had decided to go myself, you should want to do what I proposed long ago. If I wait for you to go to-morrow, another day will be lost. 
and I know I shall be unable to rest another night without having been. I want to get this settled, and will. You must visit her afterwards. It will be all the same. I could even go with you now. You could scarcely walk there and back without a longer rest than I shall take. No, not to-night, Eustacia. Let it be as you say, then. She replied in the quiet way of one who, though willing to ward off evil consequences by a mild effort, would let events fall out as they might, sooner than wrestle hard to direct them. Clem then went into the garden, and a thoughtful languor stole over Eustacia for the remainder of the afternoon, which her husband attributed to the heat of the weather. In the evening he set out on the journey. Although the heat of summer was yet intense, the days had considerably shortened, and before he had advanced a mile on his way, all the heath purples, browns, and greens had merged in a uniform dress without airiness or gradation, and broken only by touches of white, where the little heaps of clean quartz sand showed the entrance to a rabbit burrow, or where the white flints of a footpath lay like a thread over the slopes. In almost every one of the isolated and stunted thorns which grew here and there, a night-hawk revealed his presence, by whirring like the clack of a mill, as long as he could hold his breath, then stopping, flapping his wings, wheeling round the bush, alighting, and, after a silent interval of listening, beginning to whirr again. At each brushing of Klim's feet, white millimoths flew into the air just high enough to catch upon their dusty wings the mellowed light from the west, which now shone across the depressions and levels of the ground, without falling thereon to light them up. Yobright walked on amid this quiet scene, with a hope that all would soon be well. Three miles on, he came to a spot where a soft perfume was wafted across his path, and he stood still for a moment to inhale the familiar scent. It was the place at which, four hours earlier, his mother had sat down exhausted on the knoll covered with shepherd's thyme. While he stood, a sound between a breathing and a moan suddenly reached his ears. He looked to where the sound came from, but nothing appeared there save the verge of the hillock stretching against the sky in an unbroken line. He moved a few steps in that direction, and now he perceived a recumbent figure almost close at his feet. Among the different possibilities as to the person's individuality, there did not for a moment occur to Yobright that it might be one of his own family. Sometimes furze cutters had been known to sleep out of doors at these times, to save a long journey homeward and back again. But Klim remembered the moan, and looked closer, and saw that the form was feminine, and a distress came over him like cold air from a cave. But he was not absolutely certain that the woman was his mother, till he stooped and beheld her face, pallid and with closed eyes. His breath went, as it were, out of his body, and the cry of anguish, which would have escaped him, died upon his lips. During the momentary interval that elapsed before he became conscious that something must be done, all sense of time and place left him, and it seemed as if he and his mother were as when he was a child with her many years ago on this heath at hours similar to the present. Then he awoke to activity, and bending yet lower he found that she still breathed, and that her breath, though feeble, was regular, except when disturbed by an occasional gasp. "'Oh, what is it? Mother! Are you very ill?' 
You're not dying! He cried, pressing his lips to her face. I am your Clem! How did you come here? What, what does it all mean? At that moment the chasm in their lives, which his love for Eustacia had caused, was not remembered by Yobright, and to him the present joined continuously with that friendly past that had been their experience before the division. She moved her lips, appeared to know him, but could not speak, and then Klim strove to consider how best to move her as it would be necessary to get her away from the spot before the dews were intense. He was able-bodied, and his mother was thin. He clasped his arms round her, lifted her a little, and said, Does that hurt you? She shook her head, and he lifted her up. Then, at a slow pace, went onward with his load. The air was now completely cool, but whenever he passed over a sandy patch of ground uncarpeted with vegetation, there was reflected from its surface into his face the heat which it had imbibed during the day. At the beginning of his undertaking, he had thought but little of the distance which yet would have to be traversed before Bloom's End could be reached. But though he had slept that afternoon, he soon began to feel the weight of his burden. Thus he proceeded, like Aeneas with his father, the bats circling round his head, night-jars flapping their wings within a yard of his face, and not a human being within call. While he was yet nearly a mile from the house, his mother exhibited signs of restlessness under the constraint of being borne along, as if his arms were irksome to her. He lowered her upon his knees, and looked around. The point they had now reached, though far from any road, was not more than a mile from the Bloom's End cottages occupied by Fairway, Sam, Humphrey, and the Cantles. Moreover, fifty yards off stood a hut, built of clods and covered with thin turves, but now entirely disused. The simple outline of the lonely shed was visible, and thither he determined to direct his steps. As soon as he arrived he laid her down carefully by the entrance, and then ran and cut with his pocket-knife an armful of the driest fern. Spreading this within the shed, which was entirely open on one side, he placed his mother thereon, then he ran with all his might towards the dwelling of Fairway. Nearly a quarter of an hour had passed, disturbed only by the broken breathing of the sufferer, when moving figures began to animate the line between heath and sky. In a few moments Klim arrived, with Fairway, Humphrey, and Susan Nunsuch. Ollie Dowden, who had chanced to be at Fairway's, Christian and Granfer Cantle, following helter-skelter behind. They had brought a lantern and matches, water, a pillow, and a few other articles which had occurred to their minds in the hurry of the moment. Sam had been dispatched back again for brandy, and a boy brought Fairway's pony, upon which he rode off to the nearest medical man with directions to call at Wild Eve's on his way, and inform Thomasin that her aunt was unwell. Sam and the brandy soon arrived, and it was administered by the light of the lantern, after which she became sufficiently conscious to signify by signs that something was wrong with her foot. Ollie Dowden at length understood her meaning, and examined the foot indicated. It was swollen and red. Even as they watched, the red began to assume a more livid colour, in the midst of which appeared a scarlet speck, smaller than a pea, and it was found to consist of a drop of blood which rose above the smooth flesh of her ankle in a hemisphere. "'I know what it is!' cried Sam. "'She's been stung by an adder!' "'Yes,' said Clem instantly. 
I remember when I was a child seeing just such a bite. Oh, my poor mother! It was my father who was bit, said Sam, and there's only one way to cure it. You must rub the place with the fat of other adders, and the only way to get that is by frying them. That's what they did for him. "'Tis an old remedy,' said Klim, distrustfully, "'and I have doubts about it. "'But we can do nothing else till the doctor comes.' "'Tis a sure cure,' said Ollie Dowden, with emphasis. "'I've used it when I used to go out nursing.' "'Then we must pray for daylight to catch them,' said Klim, gloomily. "'I see what I can do,' said Sam. He took a green hazel which he had used as a walking stick, split it at the end, inserted a small pebble, and with the lantern in his hand went out into the heath. Clem had by this time lit a small fire, and dispatched Susan Nunsuch for a frying pan. Before she had returned, Sam came in with three adders, one briskly coiling and uncoiling in the cleft of the stick, and the other two hanging dead across it. "'I've only been able to get one alive and fresh as he ought to be,' said Sam. "'These limp ones are two I killed today at work. "'But as they don't die till the sun goes down, "'they can't be very stale meat.' "'The live adder regarded the assembled group "'with a sinister look in its small black eye, "'and the beautiful brown and jet pattern on its back "'seemed to intensify with indignation.' Mrs. Yobright saw the creature, and the creature saw her. She quivered throughout, and averted her eyes. "'Oh, look at that!' murmured Christian Cantle. "'Neighbours, how do we know but that something of the old serpent in God's garden, that give the apple to the young woman with no clothes, lives on in adders and snakes still? Look at his eye!' For all the world, like a villainous, what a black current. Tis to be hoped he can't ill wish us. There's folks in Heath who've been overlooked already. I'll never kill another adder as long as I live. Well, tis right to be a fear of things if folks can't help it, says Grandfather Cantle. T'would have saved me many a brave danger in my time. I fancy I heard something outside the shed, said Christian. Oh, I wish troubles would come in the daytime, for then a man could show his courage, and hardly beg for mercy of the most broomstick old woman he should see, if he was a brave man and able to run out of her sight. Even such an ignorant fellow as I should know better than do that, said Sam. Well, there's calamities where we least expect it, whether or no. Neighbours, if Mrs. Yobright were to die... Do you think we should be took up and tried for the manslaughter of a woman? No, they couldn't bring it in as that, said Sam, lest they could prove we'd been poachers at some time of our lives. Ah, but she'll fetch round. No, if I'd been stung by ten adders, I should hardly have lost a day's work for it, said Grandfather Cantle. Such is my spirit when I'm on my mettle. But perhaps tis natural in the man trained for war. Yes, I've gone through a good deal, but nothing ever came amiss to me after I joined the locals in four. He shook his head and smiled at a mental picture of himself in uniform. Oh, I was always first in the most gallantest scrapes in my younger days. I suppose that was because they always used to put the biggest fool of four, said Fairway from the fire, besides which he knelt, blowing it with his breath. Do you think so, Timothy? said Grandfather Cantle, coming forward to Fairway's side, with sudden depression in his face. Oh, then a man may feel for years that he is good solid company, and be wrong about himself after all. Never mind that question, Grandfather. Stir your stumps and get some more sticks. Tis very nonsense of an old man to prattle so, when life and death's in mangling. Yes, yes, said Grandfather Cantle, with melancholy conviction. Well, this is a bad night altogether, 
for them that have done well in their time. And if I were ever such a dab at the old boy or tenor viol, I shouldn't have the art to play tunes upon him now. Susan now arrived with the frying pan, when the live adder was killed and the heads of the three taken off. The remainders, being cut into lengths and split open, were tossed into the pan, which began hissing and crackling over the fire. Soon a rill of clear oil trickled from the carcasses, whereupon Klim dipped the corner of his handkerchief into the liquid and anointed the wound. End of chapter 7